evening. Welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Let's all stand for the first song, The Lily of the Valley, 333 in your hymn books. I have found a friend in Jesus. Sing it out to the Lord. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley. I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to hold. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He, all my griefs is taken, and all my sorrows born. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty plow. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart, and now he keep me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my... Sing it out of the last. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me. While I live by faith and do His blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With His manna He my hungry soul shall fill. Sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face Where rivers of delight shall ever roll He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul All right, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for today. And we're thankful, Lord, for this song. And what it means, God, we're thankful for the friendship that we can have in you, the relationship that we can have with you. God, we're thankful that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. We're thankful that you'll fight for us, you'll be our shield, you'll be our buckler. Lord, we're thankful, uh, God, for the fact that we're saved. And uh, Lord, that we just, we have this relationship with you. We have heaven as our home. We have eternal life, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what you've done, the finished work on the cross. And uh, God, we just stand before you amazed. We stand before you thankful. And uh, how awesome it is to be forgiven. And I pray, God, that you please would bless tonight. I pray that you would bless uh, the time of prayer. I pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship. I pray that you'd bless uh, the time of singing. And I pray that you'd bless the preaching and teaching of your word. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. We have the missionary of the week, Dr. and Mrs. Bob Bowen, missionaries to Thailand and Southeast Asia. And they were just with us back in February. And um, just uh, be in prayer for them. It was great, great seeing them um, while they were here during our missions emphasis weekend. Um, and this is a letter that we got in both July and August. Uh, their July update and August update. Uh, July, the July update reads: Tan turned 25 years old on July 1st. Tan is our scripture distribution manager for B for Best Mission in Thailand. I've known Tan since he was three years old. Tan also serves on staff at International Baptist Church in Hua Hin, Thailand. Tim Shook is a pastor and leader of F FBMI Team Thailand. Tan is one of the finest young men I know in Thailand. Please do not... I need some changes. Lord, I'm coming back to you. Changes. Well, on my own, I just can't do. A lot of fire in my heart. Bring me back to your loving arms. Lord, I'm coming back to you. Changes. I need some changes. Lord, I'm coming back to you. Changes. Well, on my own, I just can't 
just can't do Light a fire in my heart And bring me back to your loving arms Well, Lord, I'm coming back to you Changes born to sing his praises I was born to testify but when I'm singing about my Jesus oh that's when I feel alive oh I just can't help myself I've got to tell it I just can't keep it locked up inside cuz I was born to sing his praises I was born to testify well when I met the Lord I found my reason happiness and joy replaced my shame cause now I know he saved me for his glory 
So I'm giving all the glory to his name. I was born to sing his praises. I was born to testify. When I'm singing about my Jesus, well, that's when I feel alive. I just can't help myself. I've got to tell it. I just can't keep it locked up inside. I was born to sing his praises. I was born to testify. Well, it seems like all I do nowadays is talk about Jesus. Well, some folks think I get a little bit carried away. Oh, but I've been given a voice and I'm going to use it. Praise the one who took my sin away. I was born to sing his praises. I was born to testify. When I'm singing about my Jesus, well, that's when I feel alive. I just can't help myself. I've got to tell it. I just can't keep it locked up inside. I was born to sing his praises. I was born to testify. Cause I was born to sing his praises. I was born to testify. And work without applause A man who raised the shield of faith Protecting what is pure Whose love is tough and gentle A man whose word is sure God the deed and orator Who knows just what to say He doesn't need authorities on him away he doesn't need an army to guarantee a win he just needs a few good men men full of compassion who laugh and love and cry men who face eternity and aren't afraid to die been renewed he calls the ones who know his son to stand up for the truth enlistment lines are open and he wants you to come in he just needs a few good men men full of compassion to laugh and love and cry and aren't afraid to die. 
something's missing Hear a still small voice You just keep dismissing Do you know how it feels Troubled inside To think just for you On a cross of one night Do you know how it feels When he knocks to surrender Have your sins washed away Never to be remembered And know that it's real Tell me, do you know how it feels? And how does it feel to know you're a child of the King? Your heavenly Father owns everything. How does it feel to know you are loved by the one who created the stars up above? 
We're going to sing our next song. Let's all stand. He leadeth me. singing one more song number 534 cleanse me
fashion self and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. announcements this Friday. We have Teen Club September 15th. Um, that'll start at 6 o'clock. It'll go from 6 to 8.30. Uh, reminder that next week is Fall Kids Club. We'll be starting uh, September 20th, and that is, that'll start at 6.15 to 8 o'clock. Uh, Daughters of the King, uh, s- September 16th. Um, where is Derek? Derek, you're going to give this announcement. Mademoiselle, um, Macaroon in Mullica Hill. Um, please let Misty know um, today, tonight, if you're planning on meeting at the church uh, for a carpooling. Um, that way she knows if she has to wait for anyone. Otherwise, you guys can meet there at 11 o'clock, wear your best tea hat, and um, there's shops nearby for, uh, to walk. And again, that's September 16th. Cottage prayer meeting, September 21st at Pastor's House at 630 if you'd like to host a future prayer meeting, uh, you can see Pastor and myself, and we can get you on the calendar. Sunday School Conference, Saturday, September 23rd, and we'll be leaving the church at 9 o'clock. If you're interested in going, please let us know. And then Omega Group Luncheon, October 6th, uh, that's uh, all senior saints 55 and older. are invited to join the Omega Group uh, for a luncheon on Friday afternoon um, here at the church. If you have any questions, you can see Mrs. Carol Price. There is a sign-up sheet on the baptistry just so that they can get a head count for that. Uh, that is it for announcements. If you brought an offering, we have our offering box on the back wall there, or you can give online through our website. Let's pray for the offering. Lord God, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, for this opportunity, Lord, that we can worship you through our tithes and our offerings, Lord. You pray, God, that you would have your hand over what's collected, Lord, that you would bless and multiply it. God, we pray, Lord, that you would use it to further your word. And God, we pray, Lord, that we would steward it wisely for you. Thank you, God, for just continuing to meet the needs of the church. God, pray for the message that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would work in our life. God, we're so thankful, Lord, that we can gather here um, together, Lord, Pray that we would never take that for granted. Father, we love you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to be in uh, Romans chapter 14. We didn't get very far in this study last week. And before we jump into the scriptures, I want to just make mention of this. If if you might be interested in it, I'm not sure if you are. It's not in our bulletin. We may put it in the bulletin for this Sunday. But uh, I was asked to speak at a uh, a, uh, couple's retreat, I guess. It's called uh, out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's going to be at the Doubletree. And I'm not sure, Brother Don, you might know the answer to this. Is that Doubletree, is that the old Willow Valley? Is that a double tree now, the, the, the new side of it? I think that's a double tree now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not positive either. So anyway, if you've been to the old Willow Valley, and Willow Valley had two sections. It had the new section, the old section. The new section, I think, is a double tree. Willow Valley is done. It, it was the greatest place in the world. I love going there. But um, anyway, uh, the double tree is a really, really nice place. It's got the big atrium in the middle and all the rooms around the atrium. But um, anyway, so it's, it's October 13th and 14th. It's, it's being hosted by Open Bible Baptist Church uh, out there in Williamstown, New Jersey. And uh, so I'm, my wife and I are going, and, and her brother happens to be 
in town like for those two days. So we said, well, how would you like to go to a couple's retreat? <laughs> and so, uh, so they're, they're going to come with us. And then there's, I think there's four openings. They have four rooms that are available. So if you're interested in going, the cost, it's a little steep. It's $230. And I imagine most of that is the room, but it also includes, I think, dinner uh, on Friday night. So um, if you're interested in going, um, you know, let me know so I can let uh, Brother Yanizzi know. And then we can, um, you know, he can, because he's going he's gonna to give those rooms back that he's got reserved if he doesn't need them. So, um, all right. Romans chapter 14, we started this um, last week, and we really only got through the first four verses, and um, we're talking about Christian liberty and our relationship with other believers, and when we introduced this, um, we said that in this chapter, Paul is going to give three principles that establish or determine whether things are right for us to do. You know, sometimes not everything is clearly spelled out. In the scriptures, we know certain things are clearly wrong, certain things are clearly right, but not everything is is crystal clear. Not everything is black and white. So we we often run into these areas. You know, well, what should I do? What would the scripture has to say have to say about this? And we, you know, we apply as much biblical principle as we can to determine our decisions. But when we think about um, whether something's right or something we should do, something God would want us to do. We think about three areas, and Paul will develop them in this in this um, uh, in this chapter. First of all, we think of the word conviction. You know, we often talk about, well, I'm convicted about something, or I'm under conviction about something, and that's dealt with in verse five, which we're going to read in just a minute. So I won't read it now. But in other words, can you be fully enthusiastic about the thing that you want to do? In other words, you you have no conscience at all about it, and that's the actual next word, is conscience. Um, but uh, there's no underlying biblical principle that is against what you're doing. Not necessarily something specifically deals with it, but is there underlying biblical principle that may speak against what you want to do, and that involves conviction. And then there's conscience. Is there any doubt in your mind about what you want to do? Is there any question as to whether it's right and, and again, some people have a hyper conscience, you know what I mean? We kind of think everything's wrong and, uh, you know, we're always worried about it being wrong or right. And um, so and sometimes counsel would come into consideration there. You know, the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, counselors, there's safety and you can find out from some other people about it. <clears throat> but the third principle is this, consideration for others. Will the thing that you want to do send the wrong message to somebody else? Maybe it's okay for you. Maybe it won't be a big deal in your life at all. You can do it, and it doesn't affect your walk with the Lord, but it may send the wrong message to somebody else. Uh, will it cause a person to, stump, uh, to stumble? Will your brother or sister in Christ be offended? And we read 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We won't take the time to read it again, but let's read those first four verses. We're talking about in the first principle in this, um, the first point in this 23-verse uh, chapter is that God admonishes us to receive one another. In other words, you're not supposed to be picky about who you receive um, as far as your brother or sister in Christ is concerned. Um, you know, because somebody doesn't uh, dot their I's and cross their T's exactly like you do doesn't mean that you should refrain from fellowshipping with that person. And uh, the first thing we looked at in verses 1 through 3 was we're not supposed to argue. Look at uh, verse 1. It says, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not, not to, notice the, the next phrase there, doubtful disputations, doubtful disputations, disputing. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eats herbs. In other words, he doesn't eat meat because he feels like meat uh, would be bad for him to eat because, you know, it was sacrificed back in Bible days. It was often sacrificed to idols. And then verse 3, let not him that eateth, eats meat, despise him that doesn't eat meat, eateth not, and let him not, um, let him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. And so if God's received him, then we should receive him as well. And the second point, this is what we we left off with last week, we didn't get started with this, is in verses 4 through 12, the Bible teaches us not to judge. 
And uh, before I jump into this su subject about ju judging, you know, we get, into, we get a little bit overboard with this. People, that's, I think, some people's favorite phrase in the Bible. You know, judge not, lest you be judged, you know. And uh, you're judging me. And now let me say this. The Bible does teach we are not to judge, and we're not to judge things we cannot know or see. Um, for instance, if I uh, go past, uh, you know, the bank, and I see Derek on the line at the bank with a mask on, but I know it's Derek, and he's got a pistol in his hand. He's robbing the bank. Uh, I can judge that, you know, robbing the bank is a wrong thing to do. That's a judgment I can make. Now, what I can't judge is I can't judge whether he was truly saved or not saved uh, because he robbed the bank. I can't say, well, he can't be saved because he robbed the bank. The other thing I can't judge is I can't judge his motives. I don't know why he did it. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, there's a lot I cannot see, but there's some things we can see. And of course, in first Corinthians, the Bible talks about, you know, that we are given matters to judge and, and believers within a congregation shouldn't have to go outside to, you know, uh, referee arguments between other believers. You know, uh, every once in a while, it even happens in this church. You'll have one believer gets into a little bit of a spat with another believer, and, of course, you know, we know the Bible teaches we're not supposed to sue other believers. But in the church at Corinth, they were bringing uh, other believers before secular judges to referee their disputes. And we're not supposed to do that. Find somebody. The Bible says the least esteemed member of the church would be more qualified to render an opinion about a dispute between two believers than an outside secular judge would be able to do. And so... There are some things we can judge. So we don't just not judge anything, but you can't judge what you cannot see, and you, you can't judge what you do not know for sure. And so you have to have all the facts. But anyway, look at verse 4. The Bible says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So basically what the Bible's teaching there is every one of us, we're all servants of God. And if these people that we're judging are God's servants, then God will take care of them, and we don't have to insert ourselves in between their relationship, the relationship between God and that person. And so each individual believer will ultimately only have to answer to his own master, and his own master is Christ. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what people think. Um, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what the world's opinion of you is or what even other believers' opinion or other churches' opinions of you are. Really, what only matters is what God thinks. And in our devotion today, we were in the, um, we were in the book of uh, Ezekiel, and we have one more day in the book of Ezekiel going through. We're in uh, 47 and 48, we're reading tomorrow. But in, I think it was in chapter 46, or it was in the reading for today, so that's 44 through 46, somewhere in there, um, you know, God was admonishing the priests and the Levites that had got caught up with all the sins of Judah prior to the Babylonian destruction. And he said, look, you're going to bear your iniquity. In other words, I am going to hold you accountable for some of the stuff you did or didn't do prior to the judgment that fell. However, he said, you're still going to be able to serve me. I'm still going to allow you to minister. So God gave them a second opportunity, but the second opportunity was not in the same place that they once occupied. So at one time, they would be inside the Holy of Holies, and they were ministering there in the temple, uh, maybe not as the high priest, but maybe they offered incense or whatever in the whole, or put the, the bread on the table of showbread. He said, well, you're not going to be able to do that anymore because of what happened, but I'm still going to give you an opportunity to serve outside. Uh, I'm still going to allow you to serve. You know, you, you may be able to, you know, slay the burnt offering or put it on the, the brazen altar or whatever. I'll give you that position. And we got into this discussion in the noon Zoom today about the fact that, you know, like everybody's got different rules regarding that stuff. You know, if, if something happens to somebody, they fall, you know, what are they going to be allowed to do? There are some churches that they won't let you do anything. For instance, if you've gone through a divorce, they won't let you 
teach a Sunday school class. They won't be laying. You can't be an usher. Um, if there are some churches, if you have a TV, now we've got three of them in the auditorium here. If you have a TV, you can't be a member of the church. I mean, there's just really, really strict rules. And and what I'm saying is this regarding that. That's corporately in a church setting. Um, you know, we got to be careful that us, we're not judging other people, other churches for what they do in their context, and and they need to cut us some slack too because we're in our own unique setting here. And so everybody's different. Every church is different. And so be careful about being judgmental of somebody who believes a little bit differently than you do. Maybe they're a little stronger in their convictions than we are. Uh, corporately as a church or another believer, corporately uh, as an individual, maybe they're a little stronger than we are. Um, we're not going to say, well, they're legal. You know who a legalist is? A legalist is the guy who's got standards a little higher than you are. And you know who a real bad sinner is? real bad sinner is somebody who's not doing what you're doing. He's doing something different than you're doing. He's really bad, but my sin's not real bad. And that's the way we tend to look at things, and it's, it's really a crazy way. Look at verse 5, and he gives some illustrations here. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Notice what he says here. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And so, you know, the reference here, you know, in the early church particularly, there were differences in the observances of Sabbath days. Uh, you know, the early church, some of them up, continued to observe the Sabbath. They saw the Sabbath as a special day. Now, of course, the Bible tells us that all those special days and holidays and feast days, they were all nailed to the cross. And so we observe Sunday. You know, we get together, we gather together on the first day of the week. And that's our day to worship. But, you know, you can see how we can get that crazy like that. If, if somebody's guilty of not going to church on Sunday because they're doing something else, we almost make it a law and say, well, if you don't go to church on Sunday, you're not right with God. Again, we can't judge why they're doing what they're doing. And, um, and so, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of ways that this can be applied. And this is something really we as individual members within the church have to get a hold of because there are going to be people in the church that are going to do things differently than you, and you need to be careful you're not judging them. Either way, whether they're stronger than you are or, quote, weaker than you are. And this is where conviction comes in. Each believer must be fully persuaded that what he is doing is right for him or not. Now, if a man sins against his own conscience, that's a different story. Um, but they don't necessarily have to agree with our conscience. You follow what I'm saying? Look at verse 6. He that regardeth the day, regarding meaning they observe it as a special day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, they don't think that day is a big deal. To the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, in other words, they refrain from eating certain, certain things. Um, because of spiritual reasons. Um, to the Lord he eateth not and giveth God thanks. So if I am fully persuaded in my own mind and that I believe the thing that I allow or that I'm not allowing is right, I need to know that for sure in my own heart, my own relationship with God. I've got to be fully persuaded. I, I can't allow you to fully persuade me. I can't live my life based on your convictions. I have to live my life based on my convictions. Now, having said that, we can help each other. We can share why we believe what we believe. I can offer my opinion. You can say, well, what does you and your family do about this situation? And I'll tell you what we do and why and what that's based on. But I can't make the decision for you. And again, we're not talking about things that are crystal clear. We're not talking about, uh, well, you know, I'm really thinking about murdering somebody. Well, I just, you know, there's certain verses in the Bible that are kind of against that. So I, I really, you know, in my house, I really don't think it's right to murder people. But I'm not judging you. You do what you want. No, murder is wrong. And it's clear in the scriptures. But there are a lot of things that aren't as clear in the scriptures. Look at verses 7 and 8. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And um, so in context, this verse is not saying that each of our lives affects the people around us, though that's how we commonly interpret that verse. That's commonly how we use it. What it is stating is that everything we do in life is tied into our relationship with God. 
In other words, if you have a strong relationship with God, that's going to be reflected in the way you live your life. Someone once said that you bring Christ with you wherever you go. And if you can go to a place and it does not displease the Lord, then it's okay for you to go there. But I can think of several places I've been in my life that I know the Lord would be nowhere near. And uh, I'm not saying he wouldn't be near there to try to reach somebody and pull them out of there. But I'm just saying I've, I've uh, participated in some things that and even recently that I thought maybe the Lord would not be so happy with me being here and being involved in this. And uh, Dr. McGee said this, J. Vernon McGee said, questionable amusements are wrong for the believer if they are questionable to him. If he can participate in them and maintain a close relationship with Christ, they're not wrong for him. And uh, he tells this little story. He says, many years ago in Tennessee, a young lady went to her pastor with the question, do you think it's wrong for a Christian to dance? Now, again, this is going back about uh, 50 years ago when uh, J. Vernon McGee wrote this. Um, and he, he said to her, anywhere you can take Jesus Christ with you is all right to go. And that made her angry. She said, well, I can't take him to the dance. The, past, the pastor said, uh, or, or, or she said, well, I can take him to the dance. The pastor said, then go ahead. So she went to the dance. A boy whom she had not met before cut in on her and danced with her. She had determined to take Jesus with her, so she asked him, are you a Christian? He said, no. Wanting to make conversation with her, he asked, are you a Christian? She said, yes. And this is what the unbeliever said. Then what are you doing here? <laughs> he was shocked that she was there. And after she got home that night, she decided that maybe she couldn't take the Lord Jesus Christ there after all. And you follow what I'm saying. I've been in situations. I remember one time, I've shared this illustration many times. Um, you know, they always say Christians should never go into a bar, right? And uh, nowadays, you, you, you really can't help but go into a bar because there's not a restaurant in town that doesn't serve alcohol, and they all have a bar, uh, at, the, at the, their section. And there's still some old-time hardliners out there that will rev, will not go to any place that serves alcohol. You always got to find, sometimes you got to drive to Lancaster, Pennsylvania to find that place. But, uh, but you, you know, you follow what I'm saying. But one time, uh, there was a guy that was at the Christian Bible Church, back Bayview Baptist Church. Before it was Bayview Baptist Church, it was the Christian Bible Church. And uh, he was struggling. He, Him and his wife ran into problems. He was a really... Uh, he was called to the ministry. He was on fire for the Lord, but something tragic happened in his marriage, and, man, he just really struggled. And uh, so we went by to visit him, me and Mike Sanzone, and, and um, we went to uh, his house. His wife was there, and she said, she said, no, he's not home, but she said, I know where he is. And sure enough, he was in a bar, and uh, it was a bar in Beechwood right by where Brother Charlie College is watching the live stream right now, right around the corner from his house. And I forget the name of that place. Charlie was uh, here at the auditorium. He could tell me the name of it. So anyway, Mike and I walk in there. And, you know, we've always heard a million times. And we were going in there for the sole purpose of trying to get him to come out. But it was a weird experience. I walked in there, and this is just a bar. There's no restaurant involved in this place at all. I mean, it's just a bar. And so we walked in, and, man, it just felt like, Man, every eye was upon us as we walked in there. And uh, we tried everything we could to get him out of there. And we felt like we had right reasons. But logic with me, could somebody maybe driving by, seeing me and Mike go into that bar that day, possibly they could have got the wrong idea, right? So you do have to be careful. You have to think about these things. And so now I, I believe it was still right. I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm good with going in there. We were trying to get him out of there. Um, but you follow what I'm saying. This is all stuff you have to take into consideration. This is stuff you have to take into consideration, not, you, not another person for you. You have to be fully persuaded in your own mind. And uh, sometimes those decisions are not that easy to make. Sometimes you have to pray about it, and sometimes you have to consult the scriptures, and sometimes you have to consult you know, godly counsel. Um, but anyway, look at verse 9. For to this end both... Uh, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. And this, you know, it's a parenthetical verse. Paul uses a lot of parenthetical statements to support the statement that he just made. And the statement he just made is in verse 8. And, um, and so the bottom line is this. We are purchased possessions of Christ. We belong to him. Christ's death and resurrection give him the right 
to exercise lordship over the individual. And so we belong to the Lord. And we really can't do what we want to do if Christ doesn't want us to do that. We're bought with a price, the Bible says. Look at verse 10. Why, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so Paul now concludes the argument, we're not to judge our brother or set it not, not meaning nothing. In other words, saying our brother's an idiot or our brother's wrong or just dismiss him altogether um, and, or hold him in low esteem. We're not to do that. And, and look at verse 12. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. In other words, everybody. Do you think there's any one of us that's not going to have something to... Uh, be ashamed of um, when we stand before the Lord. Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So we're all going to have to answer to God individually. I won't have to give an account for you and you won't have to give an account for me. Even as a pastor, I'm not going to have to give an, give an account for the decisions that the people in my church make I'm only going to have to answer for what I taught them. Now, if I taught you to make bad decisions, that's that's on me. You know, just like we we were reading in Ezekiel. You know, if 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 I don't warn, uh, then the blood is on my hands. But if I warn and you go ahead and do it anyway, the blood is on your hands. And so I'm only going to have to answer for what I teach and uh, and for the example that I lead. That's what I'm going to have to answer for, and I'm going to have to answer for my own life and my own walk with God. Now, I'm just going to jump into the first part of this next point. In verses 13 through 23, I want to show you a, a graphic. Um, in, in, in verses 13 through 23, the idea is we need to remember one another or consider one another. Uh, if you look at um, Hebrews 10, 24, the Bible says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. And since we are ambassadors for Christ, our job is to send the right message to the people around us. We are to point people toward God, not away from God. And this applies really both to believers and unbelievers. We're to point believers to a closer walk with the Lord. We're also to um, point unbelievers to a relationship with Christ to, so that they can, be sa- that they can be saved. My liberty should not at all hurt my brother or cause him to stumble spiritually. And the more I grow spiritually, the less liberty I will take because I want to send the right message to my brothers and sisters. Now, if you look at that, that chart up there, that growth, I'll never forget, that was life-changing for me when I saw that for the first time. Because we are free. And when you first so we have liberty in Christ, freedom. But notice as you grow, So now you're growing. Notice what happens to your liberty. Your liberty gets a little bit smaller. And here's why. Because the older you get in Christ and the more mature you get in Christ, the more you realize what you're here for. You're here for the sole purpose of pointing other people, glorifying God. Everything in your life, you want people to look through you and see Christ. And if you're, you know, party and hardy out there, You're not necessarily showing people Christ. And so the more you grow, the more you mature. And Peter said, grow, right? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The more you grow, the more you're going to want to please God. And the more you're going to want to be a better uh, influence, a better example to the people around you. And think about it this way. The the, the perfect illustration that everybody understands is, is parents. You, you could see a five-year-old kid do something stupid, and you could say, I get that, he's five years old. But if you saw his 10-year-old brother do the same thing, you'd say, you know better. I'll never forget, my dad used to get mad at me all the time. If I was in a group of people and our group did something stupid, you know, my dad would never yell at anybody else. He would yell at me. He'd say, you know better. I don't know what they were taught, but you know better. And the more you grow, like, for instance, if you were to see me do something, you'd be kind of shocked. If I, let's, 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 uh, let's look at the illustration of the dance. We were just talking about that. And I'm not going to get into his dancing right, his dancing wrong. 
in every case, what case, you know, what they do out there at uh, Sight and Sound, that's dancing, is that wrong? I don't think so. Uh, you know, is, is it wrong for you to dance with your wife in the privacy of your home? I don't think that's wrong either. You know, so we're not going to get into all that. But what I am saying is this. If you were to see Pastor Clark, you know, out in the middle of a discotheque, jiving around with some hat with a feather in it, you, you would probably be shocked at that, right? You, you would probably look and say, oh, I don't know, that just doesn't seem consistent with who he is. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because you expect more of him, you know, because he supposedly has grown spiritually. And so sometimes when our life is inconsistent with our growth, uh, it paints a bad picture for the people around us. And so we need to be careful about that. You're, the more you grow, the higher you go in this thing called the Christian life, probably the less liberty. Now, you could take it and you understand it better than you ever understood it. You understand you can do whatever you want, but all things are profitable unto me. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are profitable. Not all things are expedient. Meaning it's not necessarily either good for me and it may not be good for the cause of Christ. It may not be good for the brother or sister that's watching me. And again, I'm not trying to get you to, you know, walk around like, oh, I got to be careful because everybody's watching me. And, you know, it's all about other people and what they're seeing and all that kind of stuff. The Bible says God looks on the heart. I get that. Man does, though, look on the outward appearance. And if man does look on the outward appearance, we got to be careful somewhat about the outward appearance because our job is to point man to Christ. Whether that man is an unbeliever who's never been saved or a believer that maybe hasn't grown as much as you are. Paul said, follow me, but as I follow the Lord. And so we're supposed to follow closely behind the Lord. And if we're doing that, we can encourage some other believers to follow us. But certainly, if we're not following the Lord closely, we couldn't expect them to do that. So we'll stop here with this. We'll start with this, uh, verse 13, um, next week, or verse uh, 14. No, verse 13, next week. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. We do pray. I don't know what uh, time. I'm sure the service over at Mays Landing is still going strong right now. Right about now, they, they're getting ready for the invitation and I know they had some people saved last night. Maybe some of those people came back, and there were some people that maybe didn't get saved last night that need to, and we pray, God, that you would speak to their hearts even more tonight, and God, if they need to make a decision for Christ, we pray they'd make it. Pray that you would use this meeting to encourage and be a blessing to the members of Mays Landing Baptist Church as well as Pastor and Mrs. Fully Love. We pray, God, that you would just bless and be with them. And bless and be with our people. I pray our people that are over there tonight, they'd get an encouragement out of the services over there. And I pray, God, that they would be changed, a little bit more conformed to the image of Christ as a result of their time spent there. And, uh, Father, we just pray you give us traveling mercies as we go home. I pray you bless those meetings uh, that are following. I pray everything goes well. I pray you bless this inspection that we're having in the uh, building edition tomorrow. I pray that we pass inspection and uh, that we're able to move forward with the insulation and very quickly with the sheetrock. And uh, so, Lord, just help us. Lord, we'd love to get into that building uh, very, very soon. And so, Lord, we pray you'd be with us with that. And again, God, we just ask that you would help us to consider what we looked at from the Scriptures. Help us to be careful. Help us to understand that we do have liberty in Christ, but help us also to understand that our walk affects other people. And, uh, God, we want to be a good example. We want to be the right witness for people. I pray you'd help us to see that. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.